over here while giving the message. You also found them. There is something strange in this place. <laughs> By the time I come here, half of it is gone. <laughs> Manasse. <clears throat> not about brother Manasse. <laughs> If you remember or not, I spoke about the same passage, I think, four or five years ago, but in a different sense. I think as a character study we did it um, for a less time, about 20 minutes or 25 minutes. But uh, God gave me many more uh, thoughts, lessons, and so many things from this passage. I happened to go through this passage once again and learn so many things from this passage. I'll be talking in Telugu as well. India ke dechi manchi pound on mein Telugu. So Telugu logar chipta on Telugu. The title of the message is Amazing Love. Amazing Love. Let's bow down our heads before we go any further. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here, Lord, in your presence. I'm standing, Lord, in the pulpit, Lord to deliver your message, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to just hear, but to give heed to your word and to humble ourselves to your word. Help us to understand what you are teaching us today. Lead us, Lord, in this hour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amazing love. When we see any unique things in the world, we tend to say, wow. I remember some people saying about Niagara Falls. Wow, what it is. If you see thick forest, South African thick forest, if you go to the, to the jungle, say, wow, what a creation, God's creation. Likewise, if you see God's love, His amazing love, you will say, wow, what kind of love is this? Amazing love. When I was going through this passage yesterday, I said a couple of times, not just once, wow, what a love God has upon us, upon us. The love, the nature of human love and the nature of divine love, it's different. If you see in Genesis chapter 25, verse 28, Genesis 25:28. Isaac, yeah, please read. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his tradition. But Rebecca yeah. loved Jacob. Yes, thank you, brother. Good enough. Isaac loved Esau. Why? Esau goes to the jungle, he used to kill wild animals and bring the meat home. And they used to cook and they used to enjoy and eat. So Isaac loves him because of that reason. That's what the Bible says. That's a human love. What about our love? When somebody praises us, when somebody gives us expensive gift, I went to India, I got some couple of gifts. I just love them. <laughs> when they praise us, we love them. But on the contrary, divine love is totally different. It's just opposite. It doesn't see any gifts or any our position, our status. It doesn't see anything. God doesn't see anything. If you see Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, 44, 45. Can somebody read Matthew chapter 5? Verse 43, 44, 45. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, but ye yeah. make it. Thank you. Here we are seeing four things. Love your enemies, bless them, do good to them, pray for them. There are different things. I heard somebody saying that Bible, oh, God has written that. We are humans, we cannot follow all those things. We are humans, we are like this only. I heard people saying that without trying to follow that. Verse 45 it says that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. 
ye may be the children of your father which are in heaven when when we do this when we love our enemies when we bless them when we pray for them when we do good to them it is the nature of god if you see genesis chapter 1 verse 26 god said let us make man in our image in our likeness our image our likeness two things so when we love our enemies we are portraying god's image to people god's likeness to people that is what our original intention is that is what god is teaching us today now let's turn to second kings chapter 20 Second Kings chapter twenty verse one to six. Can somebody read it, please? In those days was Zechariah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. And have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so. And it came to pass, a fourth, Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake and for my David's and for my servant David's sake. Yeah. See, one more thing that we should understand is, word of God, when it is written. It is not that just God gave us the word and He was, you know, cleaning His hands. He proves it several times. He proves it. So we are going to see one of it. So here we are learning about Hezekiah, Manasseh's father. So let's compare and see what is who is Manasseh and who is his father, his dad. What is the lineage that Manasseh got from Hezekiah? So here, when we read, we understand that if we see verse three, I beseech the Lord. Okay, Hezekiah was sick. So he wants to live more. He was praying to God, and then God heard his prayers. So he was claiming to God. What is he claiming to God? That I have walked before Thee in truth, with a perfect heart, which is good in Thy sight. We see in back when King David lived, God testifies. He is after my own heart. Hezekiah is one. Of a kind like that, he is one of a kind like that, like King David. He is claiming to God, "I have walked before you in truth, in perfect heart, and I did which is good in thy sight, in sight, in your sight." So here we understand that he is a very godly man. How should his children be? Should be like him usually, <clears throat> but something wrong happened. Let's see his child, Manasseh. Few, few statements here. Uh, he is 12 years old when he started to reign Judah. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became a king. He reigned for 55 years, longest reign in Judah. That is very little information about Manasseh. We are going to learn furthermore. If we turn to the next chapter, Second Kings chapter 21. Second Kings chapter 21. As Benoni read, second verse I'm reading, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Here it says he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. His father, his dad, did which is good, which is pleasing, which is truthful before God, but his son diversified. He did which is Evil in the sight of the Lord, completely opposite. Why? How? This was my big question yesterday. If you see, uh, sorry that I'm making you juggling here and there. Second Kings, go back to Second Kings chapter twenty. 
Second Kings chapter 20 verse 1. I'm reading it. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, Set thy house in order. So there is something wrong there. Set thy house in order. God is asking him to prepare. You are going to see me. Prepare your house. Set your house in order. After that, God gave him 15 years of life. 15 years of more life. So in between what happened? Manasseh was born. Manasseh was born and he became king when he is 12 years old. Which means after God promised 15 years, after the third year Manasseh was born. And Hezekiah died at the age of Manasseh's age of 12 years old. And Manasseh became king. So I understood that there is something wrong happening there. He did not set the order of his house. I began thinking, what could have made him like that? A godly man who is following God truthfully should take care of his household also. God gave me that. He may be very busy. This is one reason I could think of. He may be very busy pleasing the Lord and his ministry. He is missing to raise his family in a godly way. Missing to raise his child in a godly way. He did not take time. Maybe that is the reason. Manasseh went against him, against his father, as well as his father's father, who is God Almighty. He rebelled. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 3, and he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And he reared up altars of Baal and made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. God used Hezekiah mightily. God, Manadevudu, Aurishamdal Devudu. He used Hezekiah mightily. In what way? There was a lot of idol worshipping happening in that time. He used Hezekiah to destroy everything, Baal, nothing, no idols at all in my city. He destroyed everything using his father. Then what did his son do? He brought them back to Jerusalem. Whatever God used Hezekiah to destroy, Manasseh brought them back again. All the Baal, all the altars, everything he brought back. And he started worshipping all the hosts of the heaven. Sun, moon, stars, everything. I have seen people who, even after trusting the Lord, naming the child according to the stars. In Nakshatra, the T action was start of a pair. I've seen some people, I mean, I'm not here, but maybe in India, I've seen that kind of thing. So, what they are doing, they are directly or indirectly praising or clinging towards the idol worshipping. Post of heaven, they are worshipping them. Manasseh did the same thing. He did worship the host of the heaven. Verse 4, And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, Can somebody read? 4, 5, 6, 7. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He brought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Yeah. Um, did you read seven for me? And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Yeah. Can you please also read 1 Kings 9, 3. 1 Kings 9, 3. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built, to put my name there forever, and mine eyes, and mine eyes, and my heart shall be there perpetually. Yeah. 
We all know that King Solomon has built the temple. That time God was talking to him. He was, telling, he was saying that, I have hallowed thy house. Our God is holy, holy God. He's saying, I have hallowed this house. And also he's saying, to put my name there forever. I am putting my name in this temple forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually, continually. My heart, my eyes, everything is there in this temple. Perfectly, continually. That is what the Lord was telling at the time. And now if we come back to Manasseh, what he is doing, he built altars in the house of the Lord. He not only brought the idols to the city, not only brought the altars inside the city, or built the altars inside the city, he even brought the idols inside the temple, where the Lord told to Israel, I put my name forever, I put my name forever in this temple. My heart is there in this temple. My eye is there in this temple. My face is there in the temple. In the temple, Manasseh brought idols inside the house of the Lord. You know that in Revelation, how God was praised. Host of the heaven, keep on singing, continue without stopping. Holy, holy, holy. Devadotalo, Parishuddu, 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 and continuous Egyptian on Taramat. Parlavu. Anirita, ye papamudi, no sin before him. Even if you go back to Old Testament, how the high priest goes to inside the courts where God is there, his presence is there. If you, if you read the book, uh, Strangers on the Road to I read it around four years back. It's a very nice book. I recommend that book if you have not read already. Then they explain how the high priest goes to inside the courts very clearly. The high priest, he goes once in a year, that we see even in the Bible, and he takes blood for his sins as well as other people's sins as well. When the high priest goes, they will tie a rope to his back, to his, uh, from here to back. They will tie a rope to him. And they will slowly leave him. So he will slowly go to the main coach where Lord's presence, holy presence is there. So they keep on pulling him back. So if, if they get to pull back from the priest, which means he is alive. So these people keep on pulling him back, he will pull, him, pull them back. So that means there is some something going on and he is alive. If there is no pulling back from the priest, that means priest is dead. Lord has smitten. The priest is not holy. That kind of holy God that we are talking about. Before him there is no sin. Mari, we are seeing here Manasseh. He is rubbing sin on the Lord's face. He brought sin to his temple where the Lord said, My heart is there, my eye is there. Second Peter 3 9. We don't have to turn there, I'll read it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word. Lord is long suffering towards Manasseh, that one day he will come back. Not willing that any should perish. But that, but that all should come to repentance. That is what our Lord is. He is a long-suffering God. He doesn't want anyone should perish. Will Manasseh come back? If you see verse 6, He made his son pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and with what not. Manasseh basically opened the doors for sin. If somebody says, this is what Yehovah doesn't like, bring it inside. Whatever Yehovah doesn't like, you are most welcome. Come inside. Here we are seeing his son, he passed through the fire. He sacrificed his son. He observed times, enchantment, spirits, playing with spirits, wickedness, much wickedness. And he provoked him to anger. Can someone provoke God to anger? He just be dead, that's all. But somehow, God is showing long suffering towards Manasseh. Manasseh is dedicated, not our Manasseh, King Manasseh, dedicated himself, 
devoted himself to sin. Genesis 4 7. If thou doesn't not, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. If you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. The devil seeking us, whom he may devour, like a roaring light. And this man is a welcome that they will inside. And that line is loading now. What else Manasseh did? In verse 9, but they hearkened not. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations from nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. There were times that they were always idol worshipping and these heathen used to follow that very well. And Manasseh seduced the children of Israel to do idol worshipping more than them, more than heathens. So they exceeded in idol worshipping. Manasseh provoked them to do idol worshipping to God's only able Israel. Should God judge, judge him, Manasseh? Verse 10, And the Lord spake by his servants, the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore thus saith the Lord, God Israel, he is bringing the judgment. Second Chronicles chapter 33 verse 11 in someone read Second Chronicles chapter wherefore, 33 Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the kings of Assyria which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Yeah. So God brought a judgment to Manasseh's life. He allowed King Assyria to capture Manasseh. And he was how he was captured? Among the thorns and bound him with fetters. Bound him with fetters. Fetters means this thing they put right for legs and hands with thorns all over his body. In those days, when they captured a king, it is up to them how they want, want to treat him. They have ill treated Manasseh. For some kings, they have taken the ice. They capture the king, they take out the eyes of the kings that they cannot see. Can you imagine somebody is taking our eyes out? And here we are talking about a king, the greatest king, Manasseh, who ruled for 55 years. Who said to the Lord, what can you do to me? Who reign saying that nothing is against me, whatever I order, that goes, that's all. Greatly lived king. To that king, these people are treating this way. Among the thorns and bound him with fetters. In those days, for some people, when they bound them, they put fetters even here, to the lip or to the jaw also sometimes. They put it. And they captured him and they took him to Babylon. I was thinking what would have Manasseh thought while he was uh, going to Babylon in that situation. When usually kings walk, they put flowers. They walk in the flowers. Here, he's running in the mud. Maybe they are dragging him in the mud. The greatest king. Not just dragging with great pains, fetters, maybe cliffs all over his body. With great pain, he must be having severe pain. Verse 12, it says, And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord, his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He has nothing to do now. Nobody to give commands or orders. He was sitting in the jail, thinking, looking back his life. He has created so many groven images, wooden images, ball, idols, whatever we name it. He played with everything. He was waiting that someone would, would come and help him. Will rescue him. Will someone come? Idols come? No. 
They don't have heart, unlike our God. They don't have love, unlike our God. He waited so long, but none could rescue him. What of God says? He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He humbled himself greatly. He prayed to the God. If you see publican and uh, tax collector, Pharisee and uh, tax collector, how do they pray? The tax collector, he will not come even to the temple. He will not come to the temple because of his sins. He is feeling very guilty inside him. He doesn't come to the temple. He stands far from the temple. And he doesn't lift his head to the heavens or to the temple. Because his sins are pulling him back, pulling him back. So many sins he has. What sins a tax collector could do? Those days, tax collectors, they cheat people. They squeeze them. If people say, oh, we cannot pay, they, they maybe beat them or somehow they collect money from them, from people. They grab the money from them. If they don't do that, they don't get paid from the government, from the kings. They don't get paid. That is what they do. If I could think of a tax collector's sin, that much I can think of. For those sins itself, he is not able to lift his head to the heavens. What would Manas would have done in his sins? So many sins he has committed against God. A tax collector beats up his chest and prays to God. For that few sins, we are talking about several sins of Manasseh. If you go further in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, there it's written, the prayer of Manasseh is in some other book. But I have gone through, I did not find Manasseh's prayer in this book. There is something called Apocrypha, if you have heard. Those are parallel scriptures for Bible. They are not put inside the Bible, but they are, they are historical things written at that time. So I googled it, how Manasseh's prayer is, and I found some prayer. Manasseh's prayer. Very humble prayer. Very humble prayer. Here, when we worship, as brother led us into worship, we cry when we worship the Lord because our sins come to our minds. Our sins, compared to Manasseh, I think maybe less, maybe, not for sure, maybe less. But those sins itself, they are crying. How greatly Manasseh would have prayed, would have worshipped the Lord in his sinful nature. I don't exactly, uh, I don't exactly remember how Manasseh prayed, but I can paraphrase uh, his prayer. He prays, Father, you are, you are the Lord of my fathers. You are the creator of heavens and earth. You are the ruler of everything that exists. So many of my sins that I cannot count them. There are many, a lot, many, my sins are many. My head, I am not able to lift up my head towards you because my sins are pulling me back. But now I realize that you are the God. I bend my knees of my heart before you. Can you just forgive me? Can you just forgive me once, Lord? That is how a manasseh's prayer. Like tax collector, he beats up his chest. I don't know, he would have cried a lot. Manasseh, he prayed to God. Very humble prayer. What does the Lord do in this situation? A great sinner is repenting today. What does the Lord do? If you see, Psalm 146, verse 8. Psalm 146, verse 8. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. Yeah. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord raiseth them. Manasseh was not able to lift up his head towards heaven. <coughs> And the Lord lifted his head up. He forgave him. He forgave him. 
See the God's love, amazing love. That's the title today, title of the message. Amazing love. When I realize that, whenever I read it, I say, wow, what kind of love? So many sins. God would just forgive like that. But God is a loving God, long suffering God. Here are the two, three things that I have listed that we could learn from this entire passage. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. As we have read Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 43 to 45. As we have understood earlier, we have to show the image of God, image of Christ to people. How do we show the image of Christ? By loving, with love, loving one another, loving your enemy. 1 John 4, 7, 8. Beloved, let us love one another. The love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth God, knoweth not God, for God is love. So it looks like if we love, we know God. Where there is love, there is God. That's what your verse says. And we have to imitate what Christ has done. He loved his enemies. We have to imitate that. God is teaching us today. If somebody are mistreating us today, or till today, we have to understand they are trying their best. And another thing is, once we were in that situation, then we say he is not behaving well or not spiritual. We were once like that. That's what God has taught me. I was once like that. We try to understand that. And second lesson, love your God with all your heart heart. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 38. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment. Yeah. We have to love God with all the might, with all of our heart. Do not be like Manasseh. Manasse, what did he do? He bought idols in the temple of the Lord. What we are doing? I, I have great respect to King Manasse because we were also we are also like him. He showed outwardly by bringing the idols to his temple, to Lord's temple. But we don't show outwardly our heart. God said, "I come and live in your heart, Holy Spirit. It comes and lives in us." So what we do when we welcome sin, we are pushing the Holy Spirit out and we are filling the heart with that sin. In that manner, do not be like one I said. Love your God with all of our heart, with complete heart. Let's close our eyes. If you look back, King Manas has sins. The greatest sins that we could ever think of. He challenged God. He said, what can you do? I don't need you to. He pushed the God outside the temple, his own temple. He welcomed the evil. To such a person, God forgave. God forgave him. What happened to his all of his sins? Someone has to pay those sins. All those sins are paid when Christ died and crucified. He resurrected on the third day. When he was dead and buried, he went to a place called Bosom of Abraham. There he preached the salvation to all the Old Testament saints. Man say God forgiveness from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same Lord is reminding us today. If we have any idol in our heart, instead of keeping God, if we are keeping that idol, that evil in our hearts, 
God is asking us to push it away and fill with His Spirit. We are like His image. We are carrying His image, His likeness. We are carrying His likeness. We love what Lord loves. We don't love evil. God is telling us today, if we have any evil in our heart, push it away. We don't push it away because we don't pray. When I prayed, I got great deliverance. Hope that helps all of us as well. Pray that God may take it out and fills with His Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father,